After my episode on polymathic skill acquisition, I realized that like skills and polymathy and post-consumer praxis, these are concepts so intricately interwoven and there's just so much going on that the only way I can hope to sort it all out is by doing a series of episodes, uh, taking a, a nugget of an idea at a time. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I don't know how many episodes this is going to turn out to be. I'm just going to kind of explore it as a theme for a while. In this post, I'm going to take a crack at comparative advantage. Thanks, brother, for the uh, questions and comments about that. It helped me kind of direct my head into this direction. Anyways, so, I, you know, I've heard, I'd heard about comparative advantage referred to in the eerie sphere. Jacob wrote about it on his blog, and it comes up from time to time on the forum. Uh, but I never really grokked it. It's just one of those concepts you kind of pick up by context without actually looking up the definition of it. So I looked up the definition of it. <laughs> so, so first you need to understand absolute advantage. Absolute advantage uh, is just when you're more efficient at producing a good or service than your competitor, right? If I can stack a cord of wood in an hour and Frank can only stack half a cord in an hour, I have an absolute advantage over Frank. Simple. Okay, so, so comparative advantage is an economic model involving agents with multiple domains of potential production. Uh, what the hell does that mean? All right, so the, the classic example of comparative example is given by Ricardo. And, and look, this is all just the Wikipedia article uh, under level of understanding of comparative advantage, right? Uh, but the classic example is Ricardo's. So uh, England can make one unit of cloth in 100 hours and one unit of wine in 120 hours, right? So they're better, they're faster at making a unit of cloth than a unit of wine. Portugal can make one unit of cloth in 90 hours and one unit of wine in 80 hours. So Portugal is better at making wine than it is at making cloth, but it's better at making both cloth and wine than England is at either, right? So Portugal has an absolute advantage over England in both cloth making and wine making is what that breaks down to. If Portugal acts based on absolute advantage, it will make all its own cloth and all its own wine for a total cost of 170 hours of work, right? 90 plus 80. England will have no other option than to make all its own cloth and wine at a total cost of 220 hours of work, right? 100 hours plus 120 hours. England produces one unit each of cloth and wine for 220 hours. Portugal produces one unit each of cloth and wine for 170 hours. And there's no trade happening, right? But what if England doubles down on cloth, what it is best at, and Portugal doubles down on wine, what it is best at, and they trade with each other for the other thing that they need? Well, it turns out that England will produce 2.2 units of cloth for 220 hours of work, and Portugal will produce 2.125 units of wine for 170 hours of labor. The same amount of work is performed as before, but more goods are produced by the overall system, right? All other things being equal. Uh, and if you zoned out for all that blah, 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 the, the, the too long didn't read of all that was just that economic systems are more productive if everyone, if every agent does whatever they're best at, even if other agents are better at those things than they are. It's counterintuitive, but, you know, the simple math checks out, right? So I confess, I never understood that there was a difference between absolute and comparative advantage. That's because I was thinking only from the perspective of, like, myself, right? The simple takeaway from comparative advantage uh, is that agents should engage in comparative advantage, i.e. specialize in what they're best at, trade with each other, and this will increase productivity of the system, Okay, so what's that? Why is this interesting? So let's let's put aside continental trade relations for a second and bring it down to the level of advice for people or like how I'm trying to use this to think about uh, my life. The principle of comparative advantage is used to argue sort of like casually or colloquially that everyone should find whatever they're most efficient at, double down on that, and then trade, aka pay, for everything else. 
And theoretically, this maximizes economic production or output. And no doubt that's true. Uh, but the interesting gotcha on this is right in the first sentence of the Wikipedia article, uh, quoting from that, in an economic model, agents have a comparative advantage over others in producing a particular good if they can produce that good at a lower relative opportunity cost or autarky, autarky price. And autarky is just a fancy word for self-sufficiency. When used in economics, it refers to closed economy states, which is generally considered a bad thing. Um, but in other words, the definition of comparative advantage acknowledges the existence of other potential economic goals, such as self-sufficiency and dependence on other actors uh, or the, the international trade system writ large, right? And an opportunity cost means all the other stuff you could have been doing that you didn't do because you did whatever it was that you decided to do. You know, so, so typically opportunity cost means, you know, don't spend an hour earning $20 if you could spend an hour earning $50. The opportunity cost is $30. But for people who care about more things than money or when you expand your uh, understanding of opportunity costs to non-financial uh, things, then opportunity cost should include things like anything else you can be doing with your time, like watching the sunset, spending time with family, learning how to cook healthy food, getting laid, reading a good book, etc. This is important. You know, when I sat down to figure this stuff out, I thought I'd have uh, a line in here like, what the doctrine of comparative advantage fails to consider is the vulnerabilities of disruption inherent in specialization and dependence and also having a broad life. But it's actually right there in the Wikipedia article. <laughs> uh, if, if you ignore the opportunity cost and self-sufficiency costs of skill development, you will miss out on a bunch of cool stuff and you'll be dependent on the system and thus vulnerable to disruptions, right? So in other words, the thing I have to say is not, hey, disregard comparative advantage analysis. It's not really relevant to what we're trying to do here. Like I thought I was going to say, the thing I have to say is make sure you don't neglect non-fiscal opportunity costs and self-sufficiency costs in your comparative advantage analysis. So yeah, do comparative analysis, but don't ignore important factors like self-sufficiency and having a dope life. It's like even, you know, I think most people think of comparative analysis like I th thought it was before when I didn't understand it, which was just like, hey, just like maximize earning potential and pay for everything else. But that's actually ignoring the breadth of what comparative analysis, uh, comparative advantage analysis actually encompasses. So basically the advice is more like, hey, don't simplistically follow quote unquote rules that you don't understand because you didn't bother to even read the Wikipedia article, right? This is, this is good life advice, really. If your personal goal is to maximize the productivity of the economy, then yeah, just find whatever you're most efficient at and do that and pay for everything else. But if your goals have a little more nuance to them and include things like increasing your household resilience, being a well-rounded person, having interesting experiences, doing polymath stuff just because it's fun, and other goals that won't show up on any spreadsheet, then you need to be more cautious about going all in on one productive specialty. And this is really just, you know, I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, advice or, or strategic thinking or whatever gets taken from one field and applied to other because comparative advantage analysis, it's an economic model, right? It's a way of approaching, understanding, maximizing productivity, et cetera, of economic systems. It's not necessarily true that taking an economic model and applying it to one's lifestyle strategy is going to make sense, right? Like you, you, you need to be very discerning about uh, taking models from one paradigm and applying it to another. It's a very useful, it's a very potentially useful uh, thing to do. We should always be looking at different fields and saying like, okay, what models here might be useful for applying to this other field or this other thing I'm trying to do, but we need to be very careful about it. We can't just do it sort of casually and, and, and reflect uh, re reactively. So um, 
you know, that said, uh, I, I'm not, a, I'm not anti specialty. I'm not anti being really good at something. Uh, I want that to be clear. Uh, because if you never develop any specialty, it's, it's possible it'll take you a long time to buy freedom. And, and, you know, I consider buying, buying your freedom by hook or by crook, uh, step one, a very important first step, right? So I talk a lot of crap about hyper specialization, but I don't think it's any better to be a complete jack of all trades and master of none. Yeah, you know, I think uh, I've I've heard Jacobs write. Uh, I guess I haven't heard it. I've read Jacob write <laughs> that it's it's going to be a jack of uh, a jack of all trades, master of some. Right. Anyways, and always as always, I think the best approach is to be wise and apply discernment. Um, when it comes to post-consumer skill acquisition in the modern economy, a multi-pronged approach is probably best. And so one prong is to, de is to yeah, develop a specialty or, or a specialty cluster, like a, a combination of multiple specialties to produce a rare synthesis. Uh, develop a specialty to an optimum amount, not a maximum amount, an optimum amount so that you can buy as much freedom as possible, as quickly as possible without sacrificing too much freedom or like mental health or physical health in the pursuit of that freedom. This is how you accumulate your stash, right? And then the other prong is to develop high leverage skills that reduce your cost of living. So prong number one, uh, optimize your earning potential so that you can build up your stash. The other prong is develop high leverage skills that reduce your cost of living. And, you know, simplistically speaking, economic freedom equals how much money you have divided by how much money you burn per year. If you have 100K and you burn 50K, you have two years of economic freedom. If you have 100K and you burn 5K a year, you have 20 years of freedom. It's very different, right? So optimizing a specialty to increase earning potential increases the numerator of freedom, which is a good thing. Developing high leverage skills that reduce your cost of living decreases the denominator of freedom, which is a good thing, right? Decreasing the denominator increases the ratio or the number, right? Freedom, more freedom. So for example, I had a skill cluster of, or I developed a skill cluster over a few years of mechanical engineering, HVAC design, like project engineering, building information modeling, and 3D visualization. Uh, not many people have a skill cluster of those three things. But for 10 of those 12 years, uh, my like during my career, right, my broad skills, the rest of my skills were so lacking that I spent that I spent all of what I earned, or maybe I had maybe I had some skills, but I didn't apply them, right? So so my my numerator was fine, but my denominator was uh, also high. So then, you know, in 2020, I found ERE, I began focusing on high leverage skills and decreasing my cost of living. And that that dropped my denominator and, and the, the my freedom quotient began to grow. Um, and then, you know, in 2021, when I got laid off, my my numerator, how much money I had, basically went static. But I kept working on the denominator, I kept decreasing the den the denominator on high leverage skills, decreasing my cost of living. So even though I wasn't earning any more money, my economic freedom continued to increase, which is kind of magical. <laughs> That's why I say very low cost of living is magic. It's it just feels like total magical, uh, magical freedom. It's great. Okay, so this was a bit of a dive into a uh, comparative advantage analysis and a way to think about it. And we started talking about high leverage, high leverage skills. I think we're going to do a deeper dive on high leverage skills for the next, the next in this series on skills. Uh, Cause I, I, I talked about it a little bit here at the end, but I think we need to dive into it more to really understand what we're talking about. Uh, Cause this whole thing is like a, a balance between thinking about money and not thinking about money. You know, one of, one of my whole things is decentering money as a problem solving, uh, tool in, in one's mind, uh, because that's just a better way to human, I think. Um, 
so we're so we're going to dig into that next most likely um as this is a series i'm very much into hearing what you think uh what you have to say about uh about skills about you know polymathic post consumer praxis uh skill acquisition so if you have any questions or insights or anything hit me up please uh tyler at tylerjdisney.com um uh, and I'd love to hear it. And then we could maybe uh, have a bit of a back and forth conversation about that. All right. Thanks for listening. Until next time.